This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Dear Betsy, dear Peter, dear audience, Claudia Wedepol and I are sorry not to mention Walter Benjamin at all. Instead, our persona will be Kepler, Einstein and Warburg. But we hope that we will at least touch the atmosphere within which the relation between Benjamin and Warburg might be located. Benjamin's ellipse that Claudia showed this morning could build, might build the bridge. Am I understandable? I, I hear a second tone, but is it okay? Yeah. <coughs> The programmatic significance of Kepler's ellipse defining the reading and lecture hall of the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek Warburg unquestionably stands for the institution's work. Warburg's active interest in Kepler never let up, also after the hall was opened. In connection with the conceptual and organizational work on the pictorial atlas that he engaged in, as preparation for his envisioned trip to Italy, he focused on Kepler in once again, once again in August 1928. The previously unpublished plate one of this version of the pictorial atlas, Bilder Atlas, contains in its lower role, row Kepler's cos Cosmographicum a small picture about which afterwards might be we, uh, we, we might hear something new, until now undetected. <coughs> um, <coughs> and on the extreme right, a modern depiction of the planet's orbits. It was pho photographed on September 2nd, um, uh, 1928. This must have given Warburg the impetus to meet Albert Einstein and exchange ideas on Kepler. In his discussion of Johannes, Kepler, of Johannes Kepler, Warburg apparently used his plate one of the Mnemosyne Atlas. Warburg promptly reported to Fritz Sachsel, I found a downright heroically childlike man who actually didn't know anything about this humus of pictoriality and the magic of sh shaping spaces of thought and who, despite his state of great suffering heart, followed my pictures with taught interest like a schoolboy at the movies and examined the, val the validity of my conclusions with constant adamant questions. Kepler and the ellipse were the only areas in which I believe I did not pass well. Otherwise, he was quite satisfied with me. With the help of Dor Dorothea McEwen, I tried to reconstruct this journey and, it, uh, and its effect on Warburg in the framework on, on the, of, of the Einstein Jubilee of 2005. That I turn to this event again today is because of a find that Claudia Wiedepol made in the archive of this house. In the second part, she will illuminate it from another and wider perspective. The find, is a pic the find is a picture that shows a, a gen geometrically image in the up. Sorry. Yeah. The find is a. I can't understand this. How does this work? Yeah. So that was Einstein in Schaboitz <sighs> and the plate which Warburg showed to him in this four-hour talk. The find is a picture that shows a ge geometrical image in the upper middle and script in the lower right. The entry signed by Warburg notes the occasion and date of the drawing. Von Albert Einstein in Scharbeutz, gezeichnet, September 1928, Warburg. 
um, by Albert Einstein in Schaboyd's drawn uh, September 1928 Warburg. This certifies that this is a drawing done by Einstein to clarify his ideas to Warburg. The drawing is based on an ellipse inscribed with three X signs. A, little, a line moves off to the right from a point entered on the horizontal axis. The intersection with the ellipse is marked with an ornated E and further outside a point defined as M in, uh, entered in black. An arrow shows as vector that the, line, that the line running from left to right should be conceived as continuing. Coming from the lower left, a second line goes up through the midpoint past the ellipse toward the edge of the sheet at upper right ending in another vector arrow. From the intersection with the ellipse a line extends through point M toward the lower right so that a triangle is uh, formed between the starting point the intersection with the ellipse and point M. The dark starting point of the lines is not hard to recognize as the sun from which two rays marked as vectors move outward. The ellipse clearly describes the orbit of one of its planets. This fact is made clear by an inconspicuous detail revealed by a second glance. Above the X sign entered on the left margin of the ellipse is a tiny arc. With this ball the diagram turns into the mimetic depiction of a planet. Another not initially conspicuous detail in the neighborhood of the Sun testifies to the problem developed here. It's distant from the planet inscribed at the outer left is um, round about 3.15 centimeters while the distance to point E is at 2.4 centimeters. Thus the Sun has shifted uh, round about 3.25 millimeters to the right. To the left of the Sun the pencil was set down four times to enter hypothetical locations. Einstein thereby marked the problem with whose solution Kepler rested for decades. At the intersection two lines uh, <coughs> that count across at 90 degrees we could imagine a middle point on which the planetary orbits as conceived by Copernicus would center with an unchanging radius. But the point marked with three X's in the E do not allow these circular orbits because they lie at different radii. The four points set to the left of the Sun's site marked in black, which we saw early, uh, 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 in the last um, uh, slide, indicate the attempts to find a point from which all four positions could be taken from a single location. The result was the eccentric location of the Sun around which the ellipse with the four sides of the planet is spanned. The tentative quality of Kepler's transformation of circular into elliptic orbits is captured in this tiny little detail. Theoretically, with his elliptical orbit, Einstein could have been referring any planets, but the letters E and M make it clear that these points are Earth and Mars. Speaking for this interpretation is Warburg's entry in the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek diary, quote, when it came to Kepler, he nodded meditatively and explained to me that the discovery of Earth's orbit by means of Mars was his greatest achievement. I understood too little." End quote. Faced with the difficulty <coughs> of making his view of Kepler's calculations understandable, Einstein apparently resorted to a pencil to show how Kepler drew conclusions about Earth based on Mars's elliptical orbit. The drawn lines show the sequence of the calculating operations as developed in chapters 22 to 26 of the third part of Kepler's Astronomia Nova. The basis is formed 
from the horizontal line that captures the position of the Sun, the Earth and the Mars, producing um, a partial solar eclipse from the Martian perspective. The situation occurs rarely that they all uh, are, are positioned in one line because Mars and Earth do not orbit the Sun on the same plane. The other four points the other four points marked on the Earth's orbit show the positions the Earth is when Mars returns to the same point after another Martian year. <coughs> Tycho Brahe's data provided Kepler with the angle at which the Sun stood as well as with a second angle lag that could be calculated from Mars' position in relation to the fixed stars, which we of course do not see. The intersection, was the, the intersection was the position of the Earth. By using the same position of Mars to calculate the Earth's varying angles to the Sun and to Mars and thus to determine Earth's positions anew, Mars becomes a kind of observer of the Earth. Mars, for Kepler, becomes a kind of observer of the Earth. Einstein tried to make it clear that this shift of position was Kepler's true achievement. He was apparently lastingly impressed by how Kepler, in the mode of a thought experiment and using the columns of numbers from Tycho Brahe's observations of the heavens as well as from his own investigations, drew conclusions about the Earth via the detour by way of Mars. That this discussion lives on in the Nemosyne project is easily recognizable in plate C of the last version of the Atlas. At the upper left appears Kepler's plate of the Mysterium Cosmographicum again, which must have been the starting point for Warburg's discussion with Einstein. Next to it is uh, the modern schema of the planetary uh, uh, system and finally on the right follows the Tübingen picture with the planets. The upper row is consequently also a son of the pictorial material that played a role in the discussion with Einstein. At the lower left now, at the lower left in plate C however a new graphic appears and seems like an answer to Einstein's drawing. On the inner track it shows the Earth orbit and on the outer the Mars orbit. Earth orbit, Mars orbit. While the eccentrically positioned Sun is shifted markedly to the right, as we have it here, markedly to the right toward the outer Martian orbit, its location in relation to the Earth is, sh is shifted upward only slightly. The elliptical courses of the orbits of both Mars and the Earth as discovered by Kepler, show different deviations from circularity in accordance with Kepler's calculations. The vector Einstein showed moving towards the upper right, <coughs> approximately to the ray of light termed Herbst fall uh, in, in the diagram. The sole difference from Einstein's drawing is that the Earth's orbit is also elongated. A manuscript written in Einstein's hand and preserved in the Einstein archive of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem seems like a reciprocal response to the discussion with Warburg. When it appeared on the front page of the Frankfurter Zeitung on November 9, 1930, it was neutrally, neutrally titled Einstein on Kepler. Einstein über Kepler. Einstein elucidated in lively words that Kepler had imagined a fixed lantern in space from which position the path of the Earth could be observed. In the article he describes a drawing not shown that remarkably corresponds precisely to the one he drew for Warburg in Schaboitz. If the Sun is labelled S and the Earth additionally marked E at the upper apex of the triangle, as we see here in this reconstruction, then the connection with the article is clear. I quote Einstein in this article, thus starting from a baseline SM, SM, 
arbitrarily chosen on a sheet of paper, the knowledge of the two angles at E and S permit one to construct the triangle SEM. This construction could be made many times during the year, which would provide one each time with an earth location E on the drawing paper with an associated date in its position in relation to a permanently fixed based line SM. The Earth's orbit would thus be empirically determined to its absolute dimensions, of course." End quote. For Einstein, Kepler's genius lay in the answer to the question how the lantern M, how the lantern M, which is fixed in the heavens, had been determined. His calculating operations alone were worthy of the greatest admiration, but what was most deeply impressive was that the solution did not emerge directly from the empirical data. That is Einstein's main argument in this article. Did not derive uh, directly from the empirical data, but only in an in indefati indefatigable back and forth between formulating and testing hypotheses. I quote, it appears that human reason must independently construct the forms before we can detect them in things. From Kepler's wonderful life's work, we recognize especially well that knowledge cannot flower from mere empiric empiricism alone, but only from the comparison between the conceived and the observed." End quote. If Einstein told Warburg, quote again, <coughs> the discovery of the Earth's orbit by means of Mars was Kepler's greatest achievement, then this corresponded with the quintessence of this article, which explained Kepler's greatness in terms of the bipolarity between empiricism and hypothesis form formation. It cannot be ruled out that at this moment, uh, that at this moment he, w he was at least in part also formulating a new answer to Warburg. Hardly any contemporary was able to elude the spell of the event of Warburg speaking, and this must have been all the truer of a, th a three and a half hour talk in which Warburg reported on his central methodological problem. Einstein's bipolar description of Kepler as an empiricist and hypothesis former can be regarded as a weak weakened variant of what Warburg futilely tried to convey to him. This oblininess, if it took place with Warburg in mind, who had died the year before, would be remarkable in itself. Warburg's view, and with this I come to the end, nonetheless remained another. He saw in Kepler the spirit who, as a, quote, widely blazing torch of the Enlightenment, end quote, and by means of mathematics had emancipated himself from the historical moldings of anthropom anthropomorphically conceived images, but who also carried out this leap with the aid of antiquity. For Warburg, Kepler's ellipse was its two, with its two fo foci was a symbol of the anthrop anthropological conditionality of man of not being able to conclusively leave magic behind, but constantly having to make efforts to reach the pole of reason. Without a doubt, Einstein transiently captured Kepler, Kepler's achievement, but the history of science confirmed that Warburg's conceptual framework was paradoxically closer to Kepler's cosmology. So let me now step back from the account of Einstein's correcting intervention into Warburg's three and a half hours presentation and in fact shift from Einstein to Warburg. This presentation must most probably have been based on the materials Warburg had collected for his projected Memosyne Atlas. We have already seen it, specifically for the series of panels now called the penultimate, dated 2 September 1928. The 
Syria's very first panel, we have already seen it in detail, Strategic, strategically launching a theoretical statement shows an arrangement of images directly or indirectly relating to the works of Johannes Kepler, namely an illustration, an illustration of Kepler's Mysterium Cosmographicum of 1696 here in the edition of uh, six, sorry 1596 here in the edition of 1621 representing a model of the solar system with the orbits of the five known planets identified as plato solids a contemporary map of the solar system from Brockhaus's encyclopedia of 1905 and in the middle a 19th century cartoon showing a zodiac the tear Kreis, made up of sick animals being healed by their veterinarian. It would be worth discussing it, but I don't have the time. In the upper row of the panel, we see Mars as ruler of April with his children from a 1475 housebook next to Bacchus celestial chart of 1709. Given the closeness of dates between the preparation of the panel and the trip to Charbois, and the prominence of Mars next to the document setting out different conceptions of the cosmos, it is quite likely that Warburg presented Einstein with a similar arrangement of photographs. In, a, in the following I shall therefore ask, what on one hand did Warburg have in mind with this specific arrangement of illustrations and why on the other was he seeking reassurance from a theoretical physicist at a moment in which he was also expecting approval for the installation of a photographic exhibition about the origin and development of the star symbols in Hamburg's new planetarium. The rationale for the visit to Einstein that Warburg offers in his day-to-day -day journal of KBW activities reads as follows. I quote, reason for the trip one has to see the aesthetic values in relativistic terms. On one hand, they are so deeply imprinted that their maximum values, either intensiva or extensiva, guarantee mnemic persistence. On the other hand, are these imprinted values immune to feelings, monads without windows? Only by means of an epoch-selective will they turn into functions of attraction or rejection of life. End of quote. But can we take this alleged reason expressed in an almost impenetrable idiosyncratic language at face value? When Warburg speaks, about, speaks of relativity, was this not simply a pun on the interlocutor, who was arguably the most brilliant living representative of a profession to which Warburg repeatedly attributed the ability of perceiving the cosmos purely in numerical rather than figures, uh, visual figures? It is well known that Warburg saw his chief personal as well as institutional task as one of identifying the models in which the surrounding world was perceived. He defined a spectrum arching from science, identified with numerical data, to myth, identified with visual imagery. Myth was thus his keyword for the perception of the world, macrocosmos and microcosmos alike, as an animated entity or, as Warburg wrote in his so-called snake ritual lecture, lecture, as a way of seeing, quote, natural forces in anthropomorphic or biomorphic guise. In his 1929 keynote speech before the advisory board of the KBW, he compared his task with quote, writing a chapter of the unwritten handbook of self-education of mankind with a possible title from the human being's mythical fearing to its scientific calculating attitudes towards the self and the cosmos, end of quote. A few sentences further down, however, this, uh, uh, this apperception is no longer characterized as a historical development from one state to the other, but as a constant swinging between one extreme and the other. In other words, between, quote, instinct-driven passionate kinesis and structuring cosmological theory. The sequential model is replaced by one of coexistence, and in fact, Warburg never prioritizes one or the other, as he was certainly interested in both, one being psychological, the other historical. Strangely for Warburg and intriguingly, the alleged superstitious astronomer Johannes Kepler 
made use of Tycho Brahe's empirically collected and provable data for calculating the orbits of the planets and thus seemed to unite both attitudes in one personality. For Warburg, he was the prototype of a transitional character, the Übergangstype between mythical and mythical thinking. That again was a quote. And I've got, uh, that is basically just an illustration, one of Kepler's, like the supernova um, publication. We have really got a, an image which, which is quite similar to the Barker plan which Warburg used for, his, for the atlas. While the term Übergang, yeah, from the quote, transition implies that Warburg held to the evolutionist idea that humanity is continuously developing in one direction, he explained, as I will try to show, the supposedly contradicting persistence of a mythopoeic element in human perception by connecting the mythical with the mathematical through the idea of symbolical or allegorical thinking. Since the publication of Ernst Gombrich's intellectual biography in 1970, it has been known that Warburg's highly influential teacher Hermann Usner, one of the most eminent German classicists of the 19th century, directed his students' attention to the Italian anthropologist Tito Vignoli, and in particular his study Mito e Cienza of 1879, published in German already in 1880. Warburg immediately bored and read this book, which seems to have played its part in his developing identity as a Kulturhistoriker and Bildwissenschaftler. He seems to have absorbed Vignoli's idea of a coexistence of mythopoeic and rational thought in the human mind throughout evolution. I quote, I maintain, writes Vignoli, that the mythical faculty still exists in all men independently of the survival of old superstitions to whatever people and class they may belong. And it will continue to exist as an innate function of the intelligence, if not with respect to the substance, which may alter, at any rate in the mode of its acts of and proceedings. End of quote. Anticipating opposition against such view, Vignoli insists on the existence of a psychical law which proves his theory and goes on to write, I quote, It must not, however, be forgotten that in addition to the mythical faculty of our minds there exists the scientific faculty, the other factor of a perfect intellectual life. The latter is most powerful in certain races and must in time prevail over the former, which in its objective form precedes it. Yet they are subjectively combined in practice and are indissolubly united through life." End of quote. The evolutionist theory that the scientific faculty was most powerful in certain races and that it therefore in time had to prevail over the former clearly carries the potential of a close association with race theories. But Warburg obviously dissociated the underlying concept from any biological implication. Also his adoption of evolutionist terminology, seen in the just quoted statement about aesthetic values being deeply imprinted and having mnemic persistence, was purely metaphorical. The Erbgut, or genotype, Warburg frequently speaks about consists of a pool of prototypes, pathos formulas and symbols alike, laden with psychic energy that has come down to us through imagery from a not quite clearly defined antiquity. Whereas the ability to live, relive and express some fundamental emotional experiences is indeed innate, the selection of prototypes is, as Warburg sees it, controlled by will. In the final paragraph of the Snake Ritual Lecture, Warburg speaks about the natural sciences as being born from myth. With this easily overlooked statement, I'd like to return to the genesis of his interest in Johannes Kepler's achievements. It was sparked, I believe, by Warburg's conviction that deliberate references to classical cosmology in art were a symptom of, symptom of the desire to overcome fear of the powers of fortune that is fear of ungovernable forces embodied in the demonic star deities 
They were transmitted through Toy Cross's late antique description of the night sky, the Svera Barbarica, which for Warburg were indeed nothing other than deformed Olympian gods. In a programmatic letter to the eminent historian Ulrich von Wilamowitz Möllendorf, he calls the Olympians, quote, mythological metaphors, whose original purely technical function had been to help ancient scientists determining the boundaries of star, of star constellations. Oh, I have forgotten to show that. <laughs> that was uh, gekauft winter semester 86, Vignoli. Triggered by rereading and rethinking his Schifanoia lecture of 1912, as it was finally published in December 1922, while the author was still in Ludwig Binswanger's clinic in Kreuzlingen, these ideas prompted Warburg to draft a new project under the title Powers of Fortune Reflected in Symbolic Images a la Antica. I've got the title page here, they do. not so good picture from the archive. Fund the type of script. Fundamental was his idea that not only the Schifanoia fresco cycle but also a number of other works to which he had devoted case studies were landmarks in a step-by-step -step transition from the individual's fatalistic attitude towards the cosmos to acts of disenchanting his presumed powers through empirical research. Warburg discussed these ideas at, hi at his first personal ex exchange with the neo-Kantian philosopher Ernst Kassira on 10 and 11 April 1924. Most notably the cultural historical role of Johannes Kepler's discovery of the planetary laws and, its stimula and this stimulating conversation encouraged him, Warburg, to continue and to quote, sketch a really sustainable new method of the cultural psychological notion of history. End of quote. And here's another example from that draft manuscript. The method of the interpretation, and here I've got uh, the Schifanoia Salademisi, I should say that. The method of the interpretation of the phenomenol, phenomenol, phenomenology of the revival of antiquity, namely to show that the cultural evolution had been allegorically predetermined by the rebirth or rather fabulous metamorphosis of the Olympian gods in the 15th century Italian art, observable in the transitional status of Borso Destis frescoes in the Sala dei Mesi in Ferrara from around 1470. And here we see the three prominent March, April, and May months. For Warburg, the peculiarity of the Schifanoia fresco cycle lay in its twofold structure. Being on one hand a majestic 12-part calendar and on the other a three-part spheric scheme projected onto the walls. The earthly sphere at the bottom, the demonic of the star deities in the middle and the Olympian sphere owed to a reading of the rediscovered Roman poet Manilius on the top. This meant that the seven planetary gods, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, Sol and Luna, had been as rulers of the months replaced by the twelve Olympian gods. Warburg wanted to recognize in the introduction of the Olympian sphere an allusion to the realm of humanitas which presented the new culture of learning that was prototypically symbolized by the triumph of Pallas Athena amongst the muses and their protégés. Moreover, by reading the frescoes as a planimetrical system of three spheres, he intended to demonstrate an underlying neoplatonic notion of the harmony of the spheres, which according to Macrobius was caused by the muses' rhythmical movement of these spheres. Helios Apollo, their leader, was the musical soul and ruler of the harmonic cosmos, which thus became a proto-heliocentric model. And here we've, I've also got the woodcut which Warburg uses for his uh, Costumi Teatrali lecture to illustrate the harmony of the spheres, like with the muses and Apollo at the ruler in the middle from Gafurios. 
Warburg's theory of scientific evolution meant that belief in the concept of the harmony of the spheres was a precondition for Copernicus's revolutionary model of a sun-centered solar system. Yet in the Copernican model, the planets still revolved in circular orbits about it, as in the model of the nested convex polygons called platonic solids of the solar system, which Johannes Kepler used in his Mysterium Cosmographicum of 1596. In February 1924, Warburg had asked his, yo his younger daughter Frede to check two things in his library for him. I quote, First, I would like to know where one can find a history of the theory of the harmony of the spheres, perhaps in Cantor, history of mathematics, and also a description of the, di of the modern doctrine of the harmony of movement, which you have studied. Furthermore, I'd like to know when Apollonius's cross-sections of cones were rediscovered, given that the origin of modern Weltanschauung depended on the mo notion of elliptical movement. End of quote. Apollonius's, Apollonius of Perga, um, whom Warburg also calls a student of Plato, is known for his work Conica, in which he describes mathematical curves, i.e. the ellipse, the parabola and the hyperbola, as cross-sections of a cone, a part of ge geometry that was relevant for optics. About a month later, Frede reported what Moritz Cantor had to say about the Konica, how they were transmitted, rediscovered, translated and edited. From his own notes relating to his conversation with Ernst Cassirer a few days later, we know what, that Warburg used precisely this information to pose his question whether Kepler had knowledge of Apollonius's texts. Cassirer's prompt reply not only reassured him, it fired his ambition to return to Hamburg, his library and the newly established group of university teachers later known as the Warburg Circle. I quote, my notion of the discovery of the ellipse as watershed of cultural epochs, that's what he writes to his wife Mary on the very same day, has been confirmed most evidently by Professor Cassira. Kepler, who studied the ellipse and applied it, wrote a letter about it, instructing one of his friends who could not, who could not visualize it. End of quote. A day after his departure from Kreuzling, Kassira sent his new colleague, together with the best wishes for a recovery and for a lasting collaboration, the relevant bibliographical references. Kassira referred to him to Kepler's De Mortibus Stellematis of 1609, chapter 59, where he described the theory of cross-sections of the cones as Apollonius had established them. This proof seemed for Warburg the last piece in the puzzle that linked modern physics to the humanist remaking of the classical heritage. In his lecture in honor of his former colleague, the philologist Franz Boll, delivered a year later in April 1925, Warburg summarizes. I quote, the entry of the ellipse in the mental realm of the 16th century finally made it possible to calculate the infinity of the universe. Things went upward and forward, per monstra as ad sferam. Kepler knew that the incorruptible function of his scientific conscience did not accept an eight degree divergence in the calculation of the orbit of Mars. Oh, that this divergence would be instrumental for entering a new era which finally overcame the Sphera Barbarica explicitly and implicitly. Yet Kepler still speaks of Mars as if he was an ancient pagan priest, saying, For a long time Mars has resisted all astronomical efforts, but the great commander Tycho has studied and recorded all his artifices of war in 20 years of Virgils. Thereby encouraged, I, Kepler, began to study Mars, Mars's precise positions, using Tycho's tools, and with the help of Mother Earth, I maneuvered around all his zigzaggings. Mars finally accepted my pertinacity, gave up his hostility, and showed himself truth. And Warburg goes on to say, the irony does not conceal the fact that Kepler's mindset is rooted in the pagan system of a human-like similarity, as was his earlier mathematical thinking. 
These words demonstrate that Warburg's chief interest lay in the symbolic value of the outline of the ellipse, which gained programmatic meaning for his own mission when he asked his architect, and we've already seen it, to design a reading room of the reading room of his newly erected library building in the bipolar shape of an ellipse. Another year later unofficially opened with an evening lecture by Ernst Kassira. Yet another clue lies in his statement that the discovery of the ellipse, quote, made it possible to calculate the infinity of the universe, proving Warburg's deep interest in the notion of space, of gaining and defining it imaginatively and physically. Shortly before his trip to Schaboitz, he must have ordered a copy of Einstein's, and here we've got it on the left, über die spezielle und die allgemeine Relativitätstheorie, gemeinverständlich. The book was accessioned on 20 October 1928, after his departure for Italy. And I've put it in company with Cassidy's work on Weinstein, and the whole section of historical books on Einstein in the Warburg Institute Library. Thank you very much. <laughs>